This chart explains what's next for the economy. It's happening again. Now, this little known concept and chart dating back to the 1950s showed the Federal Reserve what would happen if they enacted their policies and they ignored it. And the period between the 1970s and the 1980s were devastating for most Americans and those around the world using dollars. And like most things today, lessons are quickly forgotten. Maybe because the Fed, the bankers, and the government have short memories, or maybe because there's no consequences to their actions. But either way, the 1950s chart and the concept and the recent actions by the Fed and now the debt ceiling show us what comes next because it's happening again and it's not good. So in this video, I'm gonna break down the concept and the chart that we're gonna look at. We're gonna see how the Fed's recent actions and now the debt ceiling debate play right into this and show us what's coming next. We're gonna look at the winning game plan used during the last period so we know how to position ourselves as this all unfolds again so you can protect your savings and purchasing power. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss. I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong and it gets a little difficult. It gets a little bit hard to understand because the plumbing, the financial plumbing is so difficult, but I break it down, make it easy and actionable. So let's go right into this. Um, what I'm talking about, this, this concept, this chart from the 50s is what's called the Phillips curve. And you might not believe it, but this chart is single-handedly responsible for America's worst and only period of stagflation. Now, of course, it's not literally the chart's fault. The Federal Reserve was to blame. So let me explain. The Phillips curve was meant to illustrate the relationship between inflation and unemployment. It was first proposed by economist William Phillips in the 1950s, and it gained a lot of attention in the following decades. Phillips basically said there's an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. When unemployment is low, inflation tends to be high, and of course, vice versa. This relationship seemed to hold true and became a guiding principle for policy makers. In the 1970s, the Fed believed that they could use monetary policy to manipulate the curve and keep unemployment low and inflation in check. Of course, their goal was to strike a balance, but they underestimated the long-term implications of their actions. Now, the Fed started expanding the money supply let's say excessively, uh, flooding the economy with easy credit and low interest rates, if that sounds familiar at all. What they failed to recognize is that inflation is not solely driven by demand, but can also be a result from, of course, supply shocks. It's always a supply and demand. And if you know your economic history, then you know the 1970s had its fair share of supply shocks, from oil crises to wage and price controls, of course. Uh, the economy was hit hard. Now, the Fed's expansionary policies combined with these supply shocks created the perfect storm, leading to a phenomenon the U.S. hadn't seen before, and that is, of course, stagflation. It was a... Um, economic nightmare, high inflation, soaring unemployment, and stagnant economic growth is what plagued the nation. Now, businesses, they went bust. They went down the drain left and right. People lost their jobs, and the cost of living skyrocketed. Now, it was a harsh wake-up call for economists who had placed their faith in the simplistic Phillips curve framework. It was also a painful lesson in the limitations of monetary policy and the complexity of economic dynamics. Now, although this should have been a cautionary tale, we wonder if the Fed learned anything from this period, and actually, the answer is obvious. It's no, because they're about to make the exact same mistake again, unless, of course, it's not a mistake at all. Now, the Fed lied, the banks died. Now, that's a message that Silicon Valley venture capitalist Balaji said recently as he made headlines for his $1 million Bitcoin bet, which I'm sure you heard about. Now, Balaji admitted from the beginning that his Bitcoin bet was clickbait. But the message that he wanted to get across was this, that the Fed caused this crisis and it's going to get way worse. Now, before we discuss how the Fed caused this crisis, it's important to understand and acknowledge the major convergence of crises that we're witnessing. Because once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it surpasses the challenges faced in the 1970s, and it makes them seem like a breeze on a summer's day. So what we have right now is a convergence 
of crises, a crisis convergence. Now, first, of course, we have the ongoing debt ceiling crisis, which looks like it might be of kicked down the road for several years now. And of course, by ongoing, I mean that this crisis has been building regardless of the administration. Then there's the municipal crisis. As a Wall Street Journal article recently pointed out, the Biden administration may soon be forced to bail out local and state funds due to mismanagement and excessive risk taking when the money borrowing was cheap. Sort of like California going from a $100 billion surplus to a $25 billion deficit. Then, of course, there's the commercial real estate crisis. Morgan Stanley says it could be worse than 2008. Elon Musk says it's, quote, by far the most serious looming issue. Then, of course, there's the Nord Stream crisis. Seymour Hirsch wrote his now famous article that's yet to be debunked. And some in the European Parliament believe that the U.S. was involved. American allies are now starting to show signs of creating distance from the U.S. over the Nord Stream. Then, of course, there's the UK Ukraine crisis, which has cost Americans around $200 billion, not to mention the massive disruption to global trade and, of course, the huge loss of life. Then there's also a crisis brewing in Taiwan, where the war drums are starting to beat louder and louder. Then there's the rapidly growing de-dollarization crisis, where countries are decentralizing from the dollar. In fact, in a recent speech, Vladimir Putin said this, quote, many rapidly developing economies are switching to national currencies in foreign trade settlements. It's important to coordinate joint efforts to form such a new decentralized global financial system. The more decentralized it is, the better for the global economy. End quote. Now, we also have an auto loan crisis that's getting out of control. We have a credit card crisis with debt hitting all time highs of $930 billion and growing. We have a $1.8 trillion student loan crisis, a private equity crisis. You know, we have investors that are fleeing out of fear. We have an insurance industry crisis, and the list goes on. Then there's, of course, the big one, and that's the bond crisis. And that's sitting right at the center of the entire spider web. So, Let's dig into this one because it's actually the epicenter of all of these crises, and it can give us a hint of where we're headed. And of course, the Fed is at the center. Now, you probably already know most of what happened to cause the recent regional bank crisis. I've covered it extensively, but most people miss the one, the most important thing about this story. In 2020, as you know, the Fed lowered rates and projected that they would stay low for years. And then on that premise, the government sold a ton of long duration bonds to the banks. Now, as you can see in this chart on the screen, we see that banks plowed a, into these super safe bonds under the Fed's guidance. Meanwhile, the Fed denied for months that inflation even existed. And then once it was too hot to ignore, they denied for months that it was a problem, calling it, of course, you remember, transitory. And then, of course, the media, as usual, played the role of the backup singer. And then, virtually overnight, the Fed overreacted, jacking up interest rates, causing massive losses for anyone who bought long-term bonds. And the real shocker isn't how high the interest rates are now, but how quickly they rose, faster than any time in history. So in short, the Fed sold a bunch of bonds and immediately and drastically devalued them. On March 6, 2023, the FDIC chairman, Martin Grunberg, at the Institute of International Bankers reported $620 billion in unrealized losses as of December 2022. Now, that's the official estimate. Unofficial estimates say there's about $2.2 trillion in losses, such as this report from Stanford that states that many U.S. banks are facing the very same risks that brought down Silicon Valley Bank. Now, Going back to Balaji's million dollar bet that the Fed caused the problem, it's not like 2008 where banks took on too much risk. In their minds, the banks weren't taking on much risk at all. They were buying bonds. <laughs> they were playing it smart. Then the Fed literally pulled the rug right out from under them. Now, this move could be deliberate. It could be a way to consolidate the banking industry into you know, the bigger major banks, making it easier to roll out a CBDC, but that's a topic for another video. If you want me to make that video, uh, leave a comment down below. But the reason I'm telling you all of this is simple. Inflation and deflation are both coming. With the Fed's launch of the bank term funding program, the BTFP, the Fed signaled it's willing to turn the printers back on and banks 
whether they're distressed or not, are taking advantage of this. Now, the thing to understand is this is very inflationary, and so are the growing tensions and cold wars around the world. The shooting war in Ukraine, the supply chain shocks, the labor shortages, and more. But wait, <laughs> pundits around the world, smart people, are saying that there are several crises forming, a credit crunch being only one, that will ultimately be deflationary. Deutsche Bank came out with a new report that looks at 200 years of U.S. data and concludes that we're in for a very severe recession with a, quote, 100% probability. Now, of course, that's all deflationary. So we have an immovable object, inflation, meeting an unstoppable force, deflation. So what's really going to happen? Well, you put those two together and we get stagflation, just like we saw in the 1970s. And once again, the Fed is going to be to blame. Whether it's the auto loan crisis, the credit card crisis, student loan crisis, private equity crisis, insurance industry crisis, commercial real estate crisis, municipal crisis, and more, they can all be traced right back to a flawed monetary policy creating bad incentives in the economy and around the world. Now, with a synchronized surge in interest rates, with debt at record highs and unemployment rates at record lows, and of course with geopolitical frictions causing constraints in labor supply, manufacturing supply chains, stagflation seems the most likely outcome during this transitional period for the global economy. And the thing about stagflation is it's likely not to correct itself. A free market economy is cyclical, which is why the stock market tends to go up and down while still increasing over the long term. But stagflation is a tightening of the market in both labor and spending. It's an unnatural problem created by the government that poisons the economy and on the face of it necessitates government intervention. Now again, you'd be forgiven for wondering if this wasn't all by design. Now, the next question is, when will it happen? Now, of course, it's hard to say, but we know that it's coming. You can see the warnings all over you know, mainstream media from Wall Street. Even Ray Dalio has been warning that the Fed is pushing us into stagflation. Now, keep in mind, interest rate hikes can take anywhere from a few months, typically 12 to 18 months, to filter through the economy. So we're far out of the woods. As a matter of fact, we are just starting to enter them. Also, similarly, bank failures take time to filter through as well. Now, most people think that when a bank fails, it has an immediate impact on the economy. Truth is, it usually takes some time for a credit crunch to develop, and then it takes time for the credit crunch to impact the economic system and financial markets, not to mention all the other crises I mentioned, which, of course, will begin to start falling like dominoes and probably all around the same time. Now, finally, you're probably wondering, Mark, this is pretty scary. What the heck are we going to do to protect ourselves? Well, we just go back and take a look and see what happened in the 1970s during the last stagflation period. Now, during that period, the problem was keeping up with inflation. That was the big problem. How do I keep up with inflation when everything's tightening up? Now, when we look back, we can see that real estate was one of the best asset classes in the 1970s. It significantly outperformed the stock market. We also see farmland did really good during the 1970s stagflation period. And according to the statistics from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, an acre of farmland rose from 137 to 737 between 1970 and 1980, which is roughly a 14% return year over year. Also, dividend-paying stocks did very well. During the 1970s, people wanted yield, and so when interest rates and inflation soared, dividends made up 73% of the total stock market returns. Of course, you need to understand the fundamental issue with stagflation, which is you have access to fewer dollars. And those that you do have access to don't go as far. Your purchasing power went down. So when the dollar isn't worth as much, it's time to start looking outside the box to see the bigger picture. You want to look globally. Now, comparing the dollar to stronger investments is crucial to outperform the dollar on the market. Essentially, if the dollar is getting weaker, then you want to invest into whatever it's weaker than. Because Value is all relative. Stagflation will affect some investments more than others. Each country's government, citizen, and industry responses 
will be different. And that's going to put some currencies in a better position to rise faster than the US dollar. So Bitcoin's an obvious choice because of the ability to cross borders and the potential to outperform fiat currencies exponentially. Outside of that, you might want to take a cue from good old Uncle Warren Buffett. Uh, Buffett bought Berkshire Hathaway, which was a struggling textile manufacturing company in the late 1960s. And of course, he turned it into the investment powerhouse that it is today. During the 1970s, Hathaway made tons of strategic investments in wildly undervalued companies and industries during this stagflationary period. This era solidified him as the legendary investor, but really... It was a matter of seizing the opportunity while everyone else was struggling. Point is, play it smart and you could set yourself up for generational wealth. On the other hand, if you fail to play it right, you could end up yet another victim of the government created disasters. But don't let this happen to you. I know which side I want to be on. Which side do you want to be on? Let me know in the comments down below what you think and how you're going to play this. Are you prepared to come out like Uncle Warren Buffett <laughs> or a victim? Let me know in the comments down below. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But at least leave me a comment and tell me why. Of course, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss when I put new videos out so I can keep you up to date on how we're playing this. And that's what I got to your success. I'm out.